Cheers. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, my name is Heather and I work in university housing and I'm so excited to be here to um, learn from our amazing student researchers um, underneath the theme preserving Mother Earth. So I will, um, every presenter will have 10 to 12 minutes to present followed by about five minutes of question and answers. And then at the very end, we will have an open discussion for anyone to comment. Um, and so I am one of the hosts, but we also have a second host named Laura and I'd like her to introduce herself right now. Hi, I'm Laura and I will be handling any, um, any chat questions and, and handling the waiting room and so forth. Um, if you do have questions, since they'll pop up in chat, we wanna have everyone just sort of wait until the question time. So make a note for yourself and ask when it's question time rather than um, chatting a bunch during each presentation. Cool? Cool. Thanks so much. Um, we do have three student researchers that are gonna present their amazing research to us. First, we'll learn from Brendan, who's gonna walk us through the effectiveness of international environmental agreements followed by Abigail, who will talk about the biomagnification and bioaccumulation of pollutants and how they disproportionately impact the people of the Cancer Ally. And finally, Connor will join us. He's been such a great student by being in class right now and will come join us in a few minutes. Um, and he'll um, round us out by talking about um, genomic ancestry and how it's explained by both geography and ecology. So we are so excited. Um, I'm going to first pass it over to Brendan um, and you're going to share your screen and we are so excited to learn from you. Awesome. Well, hopefully this, uh, this Sharon works. Uh, can folks see my screen? Yes, awesome. Well, uh, hi, like Heather said, my name is Brendan Adamchek. Uh, I use he, him, his pronouns, um, and I am a senior uh, majoring in environmental studies and minoring in geography and women's gender and sexuality studies. And I'll actually be graduating in just a couple of weeks. Um, so this is a really exciting culmination of my senior honors thesis, which I did for departmental honors in the environmental studies department. Uh, so like Heather said, my project is called uh, Effectiveness of International Environmental Agreements, a Review of International Environmental Governance Theory. Um, so I want to start off with a little bit of a background. Um, I'm an environmental organizer on campus. I work in the University of Oregon Student Sustainability Center, uh, and I also work with a student environmental group called the Climate Justice League. Um, so I've always been really interested in environmentalism, not just from the perspective of a scholar, but from the perspective of an activist. Um, so I knew I wanted to write an honors thesis, and I really was able to define the scope of my research during a fall term class called the Science and Politics of Climate Change with my advisor, Dr. Ronald Mitchell, uh, who's on this call. Um, and it really helped me kind of take these general ideas that I knew I wanted to talk about environmentalism on an international scale and really focus them into this paper, which talks about the effectiveness of international environmental agreements. And by International Environmental Agreements, or IEAs, I basically mean just environmental treaties or agreements, anything that concerns whether it's problems as specific as ocean or air pollution, or more broadly, something like the 2015 Paris Agreement that talked about climate change. Uh, and this graph I have here is a relatively famous uh, climate change graph it's called the hockey stick graph because it looks a little bit like a hockey stick. Uh, and it illustrates how over the past 200 years, um, land temperatures around the world have risen as a result of man-made climate change, which is one of the main environmental problems that faces countries all around the globe. So with that in mind, my two research questions for this paper was first, uh, how do scholars define the effectiveness of international environmental agreements? And secondly, what are the metrics by which scholars can assess both the structure and effectiveness of an international environmental agreement? So with these two questions in mind, um, I wanted to utilize uh, the framework of my advisor, Ron Mitchell, as well as another researcher, Oren Young, uh, and several other folks uh, who talked about a framework of counterfactuals, which is basically comparing what happened with a treaty to what experts would have expected to happen without a treaty. Um, and what this really creates is the way to juxtapose two different situations and really try to tease it out whether or not an agreement itself was effective in making change. Uh, and I have this a picture of my uh, advisor's book, International Politics and the Environment, from which I drew a lot of inspiration. Um, so I conducted a literature review of 21 sources uh, from 1993 through 2018. 
Uh, and I divided my research into two categories, the definitions of effectiveness, which generally concerns my first research question, and mechanisms for effectiveness, which generally concerns my second research question. So more on that divide, uh, beginning with definitions, that kind of answers the question, what is effectiveness? So this really made use of that counterfactual structure in measuring uh, these two uh, fa facets, which were behavior change and goal achievement. So briefly, behavior change is, uh, you know, if an agreement targets uh, uh, reducing reliance on coal power, uh, then what that agreement would look at is trying to change how states use coal uh, on a statewide level. Uh, conversely, if an agreement was focusing on reducing carbon emissions, it would more specifically say, we want states uh, that are part of a, an agreement to reduce their carbon emissions. And the behaviors that it might target might be broader than just coal reduction. It might be more like increasing investments in other clean energy or um, otherwise shifting how uh, emissions, uh, you know, transportation and other such uh, things. And basically um, these two, this behavior change and goal achievement are really important because it allows using these two factors allows, especially through the counterfactual framework, allows for the direct comparison of uh, an agreement and the uh, situation in which it exists to what would have happened without that agreement. So that's the definition side. On the mechanism side, this answers the question, how are effective agreements created? So a major guiding factor in this was uh, March and Olson's logics of consequences and appropriateness. So briefly, a logic of consequences is really just a cost benefit analysis on a, on a statewide level. It's uh, countries look at, okay, what are the costs of making a change, like reducing reliance on coal power plants, and one of the benefits that you would get from that change. Whereas the logic of appropriateness takes into more account, uh, you know, standards for international behavior, cultural values that a state might have. Uh, and it's really important. These aren't, you know, it's just a dichotomy, but states don't make decisions on one end or the other of this binary. They tend to take into account both a logic of, cons logic of consequences and a logic of appropriateness when they're making decisions. And um, with that in mind, uh, I looked at four main tools that uh, environmental uh, regimes use to manage the responses of states to their agreements. Uh, which were sanctions, incentives, norm setting, and capacity building. Uh, so briefly, sanctions are uh, things that, that uh, agreements use to punish or otherwise disincentivize behavior that's uh, negative behavior for an agreement, like increasing carbon emissions. This could look like restrictions on trade. Um, incentives are rewards, like access to resources or scientific funding for states that are having positive behavior, uh, like maybe the state does reduce their, their coal power plants. Uh, norm setting involves having a regime set an international standard for behavior. Uh, outside of an environmental agreement, a common example of this was nuclear treaties in the 1950s and 60s that established that nuclear testing on a large scale was, uh, should be disincentivized and it really encouraged states you know, using that logic of appropriateness to change their behavior. Uh, and finally, a bit of a different tool from the previous three is capacity building, which basically takes states that might have a lot of interest in making change, like Pacific Island states that are going to be affected by rising sea levels as a result of climate change, but might not have the, the ability to make that change, whether they lack resources or the very infrastructure to, to meet their commitments in an agreement. And capacity building works on getting those states to catch up to a place where they can then begin to meet their commitments to an agreement. Um, so this definitions versus mechanisms uh, framework really helped me uh, with my research and was a sort of a key facet of how I structured my paper. Uh, so there were three major findings that I want to go over as a result of the literature review I conducted. Uh, the first one is that there are key similarities and differences between behavior change and goal achievement, but without changing behavior, an agreement can't really be deemed effective. So what I mean with this is that let's say an agreement sets out to reduce carbon emissions in states by, I'm gonna use the example, asking states, uh, encouraging states to reduce their reliance on coal power, coal power. Well, if you look maybe five years down the road, maybe states have met that carbon emissions reduction by let's say 5%, but if states are still using coal power, then the agreement wasn't the major factor in having the states reduce their emissions. Maybe rather than reducing their reliance on power plants, they just adopted new technologies that cap emissions uh, from those power plants. So understanding that behavior change and goal achievement are both really important facets of agreements, but uh, if an agreement doesn't change the behavior of states, it can't have been the primary factor. Something else must have gone on, whether it was a change in the economy, like I said, an adoption of new technology, maybe a shift in political leadership, uh, something else, but the agreement can't have been effective because it can't have been the primary force. 
The second major finding that I uh, had from this literature review was that different levels of these three terms, legalization, flexibility, and specificity, can really drastically alter the effectiveness of an agreement. And high levels of each of them generally lead to higher levels of an effective agreement. So legalization involves the codification of unofficial rules. Like say you have an agreement that deals with ocean pollution. And one facet of ocean pollution is making sure that the rivers that run into oceans are clean. But if an agreement has as lowly as a low level of legalization, then it might not specifically mention river pollution. Whereas a high, highly legalized document would specifically lay out all of the rules in an agreement. Flexibility uh, deals with the rigidity of the agreement. So it sets the standards for uh, what the standards of compliance are for an agreement. So let's say uh, an agreement wants to reduce carbon emissions by 5% after five years. And a really rigid agreement would uh, say that no matter what the circumstances are, no matter where your state started or ended, whether you were the United States or China or anyone else, uh, you must meet this agreement. Whereas a highly flexible agreement might offer options for states to uh, step out of an agreement if they had a shift in a political uh, uh, in, in, poli in a political leadership, or if they had an, an unseen economic uh, crash, um, like and these these kind of uh, exit clauses are what uh, President Trump used to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement. It's a highly flexible agreement. And finally, specificity deals with the narrowness of the scope of an agreement. So, in other words, you might have a treaty that deals with uh, the restoration of watersheds and. A uh, lowly specific uh, agreement with low level of specificity might uh, say that states should reduce development in uh, watersheds. But a high, uh, as, as an agreement with high level of specificity would say uh, that states must reduce uh, development in watersheds by 15%. Um, and using these three different tools, legalization, flexibility, and specificity, with a high level, uh, does, did seem to improve effectiveness of agreements. And finally, um, the four main response management tools that I mentioned, sanctions, incentives, norm setting, and capacity building, all have strengths and weaknesses, but each offers important ways to solve different problems. So what I mean by this is that the tools shouldn't be used unilaterally. Um, an agreement shouldn't just sanction states without using incentives if that state changes its behavior. It should also set norms before it can sanction or incentivize behavior. Um, and most importantly, if states can't uh, act on their, even if they're willing to make changes, they lack the ability, um, then the, an agreement should work on capacity building to make sure they're not punishing states who lack the ability to actually make change. So really what this means is that the most of the way to create the most effective agreements are the agreements that use all of these tools, depending on the situation with the state, rather than over relying on one tool. So those are the three key findings. Um, and I just want to leave with a little why this matters. Um, you know, the world's best climate scientists from the United Nations uh, International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change so we have 10 years to make major change on climate change. Uh, and so we don't have time to wait for our agreements to catch up or hope they otherwise become more effective. But we have to implement these tools and understand uh, why defining effectiveness a certain way and then why using the uh, best mechanisms for effectiveness is we really have to make those changes because we only have 10 years to affect uh, change, positive change on this major environmental problem uh, or else we risk not being able to make change at all. Um, so I want to thank you all for listening. I think uh, my friends and family helped me with this, and my advisor, Ron, who was really important in helping me guide, guide me through this. Um, and I wanted to leave time for some questions. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Thanks so much, Brendan. If you all want to, you can um, turn your videos on and we'll move it over. Thank you so much, Brendan. That was amazing. Um, and we'll move it over to question and answer. So if you want to utilize the chat function, um, which should be on the lower bottom, you can click that open and um, just send a group chat to everyone um, to ask Brendan a question. We'll have question and answers for about five minutes. I'll just say nice job, Brendan. Um, very well organized. Um, and I will have to cut out um, shortly, but I did want to just say nice job and thanks very much. Thanks, Ron. Can I, can I just ask a question instead of typing one out? Sure. Yes, go for it, yes. <laughs> Is that allowed? Okay. Um, so, Brendan, an early iteration of this project was concerning the effectiveness of uh, you know, American or other environmental activists, right? So rather than looking at policy engagement, looking at activists uh, and the effectiveness of various different activist techniques, 
I'm wondering if in a next iteration of a project like this, or if you can extrapolate out the, uh, the takeaways that you have from your effectiveness of uh, sort of inter international or governmental controls, what does that mean effectively for folks such as yourself as activists? What, um, now that we know these things, uh, what are the types of things that activists should or should not be pushing for? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, thank you for bringing up that was sort of my initial scope. I think for me, I want to do this project because I think the best way that people can affect change is to understand what kind of change they want to affect. That might sound obvious, but I think a lot of people just want action on climate change, but don't know what that action looks like. So I think that this, what this really um, indicates to me is that, uh, you know, focusing not just on the kind of small scale actions that uh, states can take within themselves, but really pushing for movements like Greta Thunberg's movement international level to actually have countries work together to make changes and do it, you know, regionally and then on a global level. And I think that rather than trying to have each country solve our own problems in a patchwork fashion, I think it's important that there are changes that be made on national levels in countries like shifting away from fossil fuels to uh, clean energy uh, um, sources. Um, but I think that if states work, I think the, the big uh, takeaway I got from this was that if states work together and are combining the knowledge of those technologies and the ways in which that we can you know, reduce emissions specifically um, and putting that into the text of our agreements, uh, that's kind of the, the best way that we can, we can move forward. So I think that recognizing that we have to do things uh, as a, a global community and not as uh, our own national communities would sort of be my big takeaway from that. Taylor, do you have more questions? <laughs> I do. Um, so, unless, but I wanted to make sure that there was space for other folks to ask. Um, but if no one's jumping, I will. Um, so what then does that mean for something like the Green New Deal, right? I mean, if, if an international uh, consortium is, is what's necessary, uh, I guess, do the, do the worst actors have an obligation to first police themselves? Or are you suggesting that those, um, that form of policing or, or, or regulation is only powerful or only has teeth provided that it, or, so long as it exists in an intergovernmental context? No, no softball questions from you, I guess. Um, I think, well, I guess what I think I want to urge with this is that I think that we can't wait to do NAT to do international changes while we wait on national changes to happen, I guess is what I would say. I think that the worst actors should make those changes, like the United States should do things like a Green New Deal, should make shifts, especially on climate change and on national policy levels. But also one facet of my research uh, talked about how when uh, international uh, environmental agreements focus on a, you know, bring the shed light on a subject, it can drive changes on a national level. Uh, like sulfur, like emissions or agreements that focused on sulfur dioxide emissions in Europe in the 1990s didn't necessarily result in reduced sulfur dioxide emissions in every state, but they did drive a wave of national policies that made changes on sulfur dioxide emissions. Um, so I think that, I guess, the, I think that there are things that the worst uh, actors should do on a national level, but I think they should also recognize that we can't, we no longer have the time to wait for those changes to happen to do things on an international level. We have to do both of them and understand that positive international change can affect positive domestic change. Hardball questions are more fun. That's true. <laughs> and, I, and I knew you'd be able to handle it. Thanks, Nick. I think we have time for one more question if there is one. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right, well, if we just wanna give Brennan a round of applause again, thank you. you. did great, awesome. Thank you so much, Brendan. Thank you all. Um, we're gonna pass it over to Abigail. All right, um, share my screen. All right, are you all able to see my screen? Perfect. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Abigail Getve, and I will be presenting my honors thesis for the Environmental Studies Department. 
Uh, my thesis is on biomagnification and bioaccumulation of pollutants and how they disproportionately impact the people of Cancer Alley. Before I begin, I would like to thank my thesis advisor, Dr. Peter Walker, who is on this call, for being my thesis advisor and supporting me throughout this process. So within this first section, I will be addressing what Cancer Alley is. <clears throat> so Cancer Alley is an 85 mile long petrochemical corridor in the state of Louisiana. The meandering stretch of the Mississippi River from Baton Rouge to New Orleans used to be known as the petrochemical corridor, but since reports of numerous cancer cases have been occurring, the entire area has been now dubbed as Cancer Alley. And while the state of Louisiana has been considered to have the most toxic air in the United States, Cancer Alley is actually worse than the average polluted air that can be found within the state. And the risk of cancer is highest in the country, and it is 50 times the national average. The state of Louisiana was rich in natural resources and offered a low cost labor force and a state government that was eager to provide lower taxes and lax environmental regulations. It has been created since the days of slavery on plantations. Moreover, the residents are disenfranchised and have no political power to leave this area. Although the plantation system has now been dissolved, most of the state's poor remain rooted in the state and the land and the society that has been dominated by the plantation communities. So you can see in this image on the right hand corner where exactly it is. And here is an image of income and industry in Cancer Alley in 2013. You can see the lower income areas, the light blue and white parcels on the image uh, are indicative of where the major industrial sites in orange are. So these are areas from ranging from under $45,000 uh, household to under $25,000 a year. And then within this next section, I will be addressing environmental justice, environmental racism, and NIMBY. Environmental justice itself is defined as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. The idea of environmental justice was first developed by Dr. Robert Bullard. He can be found in the lower right-hand corner. Here he is. And Dr. Bullard exposed how black neighborhoods were disproportionately impacted by environmental issues such as garbage dump, dumps in predominantly black neighborhoods. He's now considered the father of environmental justice. And born of the environmental justice movement is the term environmental racism. Environmental racism is defined as the institutional rules, regulations, or policies that deliberately target certain communities for locally undesirable land uses and lacks enforcement of zoning and environmental laws, resulting in communities being disproportionately exposed to toxic and hazardous waste based upon race. But succinctly, environmental racism is how the institutions from our society are exploiting and harming marginalized groups. Lastly, the concept of NIMBY or not in my backyard can be defined as a group or person who objects to the sighting of something perceived as unpleasant or potentially dangerous in their own neighborhood, such as a landfill or a factory, especially while raising no objections to similar developments elsewhere. This is a hypocritical stance supporting what is right versus what is wrong regarding the environment. Because the richer and less marginalized groups who live in Louisiana do have the luxury to live in areas where there are fewer, if any, environmental ills, the brunt of the burden gets forcefully placed upon the people of Cancer Alley. And this next section, I'll be discussing the social movements within Cancer Alley. All right. So since the our late 1970s, communities in Cancer Alley have been trying to limit the number of noxious facilities within their neighborhoods. They're also campaigning to get the overall levels of emissions reduced. Rye St. James is a social movement implemented by the residents of Cancer Alley and was founded by Sharon Levine, and you can find her picture on the top right. Initially, her goal of the group was to block the development of two new petrochemical plants in the area. Rye St. James is a local community organization with their goal being able to stop the $9.4 billion petrochemical industry. 
Moreover, residents have created the slogan, only 0.2 will do, in response to the Environmental Protection Agency's set emission rate regarding the chemical compound chloroprene. The EPA claims that levels of chloroprene within the air at 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter of air is considered the threshold. Denka, a petrochemical industry or um, chemical plant within the area, um, is currently lobbying for levels to be raised to numbers towards 30, um, 30 uh, micrograms per cubic, per cubic meter of air, claiming that this would still be considered healthy. But fortunately, the presence of groups such as Rise for St. James, there is a fight between residents and the big polluters. Action is currently being taken. This next section, I'm going to be addressing the processes of bioaccumulation and biomagnification, the chemicals within Cancer Alley with their long-term effects and how they disproportionately impact the body. So first, bioaccumulation is the net result of all uptake and loss processes. Therefore, whatever is taken into a body of a resident in Cancer Alley can stay, such as the inhalation and ingestion of chemicals that are omnipresent within the area. And this is an image of the process of or bioaccumulation on the top and biomagnification is on the bottom. Biomagnification, however, comprises of the condition where the chemical concentration in an organism exceeds the concentration of food. Therefore, the chemical concentrations and toxins move up through the food chain as they are retained in the fatty tissues of organisms. The higher up an organism is on the food chain, the more toxicity they face. So as humans are apex predators, that means they face the most um, amount of toxins in their bodies. Next, um, I'll be discussing the various chemicals. So there are over 1,000 known chemicals poisoning the air, land, and water and people of Cancer Alley. These chemicals are released from approximately 150 different petrochemical plants in Cancer Alley, and they scatter the 85-mile lot. Um, stretch of poisoned land. And for this thesis, I focused on six specific chemicals and I'll go through each of those. So first, ammonia enters the body as a result of breathing, swallowing, or skin contact. And it can cause burns to the eyes, mouth, throat, and stomach. And this image on the right with the very severe burns are from ammonia burns. Benzene is the next chemical that I ex examined, and it's one of the most chemical, most prevalent chemicals within the area. It causes anemia, a decrease in ovary sizes in women, and leukemia. Next is chloroprene, and chloroprene is a key factor in the production of neoprene, which is a synthetic rubber that's used in laptop sleeves and gloves and things like that. And 99% of chloroprene is emitted across the country and comes from one plant, Denka, which I talked about earlier. And chloroprene can cause growth retardation, liver abnormalities, and cardiac palpitations. Next um, are ethylene oxides, and they are a gaseous chemical compound. The EPA has concluded that this is uh, carcinogenic to humans and exposure leads to the, in, an increase in lymphoid and breast cancer. You can see an image of lymphoid cancer on the right. Next is formalde formaldehyde and it takes the form of a colorless acrid smelling gas. Human exposure to the compound can result in lung cancer and nasopharyngeal cancer. And lastly, nitrogen oxides are the final compound that I examined due to their high presence within Cancer Alley, and their exposure leads to genetic mutations, asthma, and decreased female fertility. And for my final um, section, I looked at policy implementation and my proposed solutions. There are two laws that are often used in legal battles that attempt to uh, protect a community from environmental injustice. The first is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And the second law is the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, of 1969 and 1970. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination on the basis of color, race, or, and national origin in programs and activities, receiving federal financial assistance. 
This is a landmark law because it emphasizes both discrimination and environmental issues. However, the shortcomings of this case are due to the bureaucratic slowness. Some complaints have been dismissed while others have had to wait more than 10 years to seek solace. So it has been bogged down over time. Next is the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. And within this act, it, there's a review process that follows a three-step approach to giving a proper analysis. And the steps are as follows, a categorical exclusion. And after this process has been done, there's an environmental assessment or a finding of no significant impact. And lastly, an environmental impact statement. And this requires federal agencies to assess environmental effects of their proposed actions prior to making decisions. The people of Cancer Alley deserve environmental equity and save healthy lives. It is appalling that larger corporations force these petrochemical facilities into areas where marginalized people dwell and have little say. By proposing stricter environmental legislation, this can help decrease levels of cancer and death within the area. Also, by not having the presence of the industry in a place where people are living is desired, but fighting an industry that is worth so much money proves to be a daunting task. Therefore, making stricter laws regarding the total emissions of these facilities and plants can also increase the quality of life in Cancer Alley. This could also be seen as the implementation of boundaries as to where neighborhoods are and where the petrochemical plants are. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you, Abigail. That was awesome. We have about five minutes for questions. And if you do have a question, um, instead of using the chat box, you can just unmute yourself for the next um, few minutes. Thank you. And when you unmute yourself, ask your question and then mute yourself again. Um, this is Peter and um, Abby, I just want to thank you for a very good um, presentation and the um, thesis itself was really a, a pleasure to read. It was very clearly laid out. It was well written, clean. There's um, nothing uh, an advisor appreciates more than that. So thank you for that. You. Um, I did have a <laughs> I, I did have a question, um, and it relates to what you were talking about at the very end um, uh, with Title VI of um, the Civil Rights Act and uh, NEPA. Uh, you were saying that the legal processes are bogged down. Um, this is, you know, not not a concern or a criticism at all. Um, there's only so much you can do in a thesis, but um, I was just wondering um, if you could, if you know, or could explain um, why it is that um, those laws are not being enforced and what sort of legal um, uh, resources are available to these communities. And it seems to me that um, I'm not a lawyer, um, but it seems to me that they should, these communities should be able to sue uh, under both um, the Civil Rights Act and NEPA uh, if the state of Louisiana is um, failing to uh, uphold the law, if uh, EPA is up, failing to uphold the law, then um, it seems like the, the remedy uh, that citizens should have in, in principle uh, is to sue to make sure that the state and the federal authorities are actually doing their jobs. Um, why is, I'm assuming that's not been available to these communities. Can you explain that? And is there a way that that could be? Yeah, so um, like I was talking about, they've really been bogged down by the bureaucratic slowness of the system or just utterly dismissed. But from what I have found so far, there are more environmental lawyers stepping in and more regulations trying to be taken into account. However, due to the lax environmental regulations of the state, uh, they kind of are getting away with it, if that makes sense. I mean, as you all just watched my presentation, they certainly are getting away with it. And so there is change happening. It's very slow though. And it's hard to fight such a large corporation because 
they are able to lobby for keeping their emission rates the way they are. I hope that answers your question, Peter. Well, sort of, um, partly. Um, I guess what my question really was is they should be able to, uh, if, if the system isn't working, they should be able to sue to make it work. Um, and why isn't that happening? I'm wondering, are there public interest law firms that um, you know, specialize in defending um, you know, uh, disadvantaged communities and so on. I, I think that is something that's happened in other locations, but I, in your presentation and the thesis, I, I didn't hear about, uh, you, know, um, you know, so-called pro bono legal representation for these communities. Is, is there just nobody paying attention? <laughs> there are, but it is, like I said, not as widely known about, unfortunately, and there's, I just, I was not able to find a great deal of different legal battles that are currently occurring. So. That's surprising and not, you know, just not your fault, obviously, but <laughs> disappointing. Yeah. Very disappointing, nonetheless. Thank you. Oh, does anyone else have any questions? I, I do. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask as a fellow presenter. Uh, I'm just curious. A lot of my my environmental work on campus has been trying to like build coalitions between different groups, and I'm just curious in your research of these activist groups. Did you like? Did you have any cool uh, kind of combinations of groups or organizing? You know, uh, organizations that emerged that you didn't sort of think to see, but were kind of a inspiration, sort of as an alternative more to what uh, Dr. Walker is talking about, but more of a, a grassroots side. Yeah. So like I was talking about, um, Rise for St. James is really incredible. I've actually found their Facebook page and they post on it fairly uh, regularly. And they just are really trying to organize from the community and work forward. And I know they are in the process of getting petitions signed and things like that, but it is a very small amount of people versus a very uh, rich company and industry. So that's what I have found. There were more... Uh, social movements and organizations, but I really felt connected with Rise for St. James, just the work they do and how they have stemmed from people of the community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, well, thank you so much, Abigail. That was awesome. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Great, Connor, welcome. It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. You're your last, but certainly not least. <laughs> All right. And if you have a um, presentation, you can share it. All right, let's see, share screen. Awesome. Can you see this? Yeah, if you wanna hit the presentation <laughs> mode. Yeah. All right, ready to go. All right, hello, uh, my name is Connor. Um, and I hope you're all ready to talk about uh, genomes because that's what I've spent the last three years of my life studying. Um, and I promise it is related to the stuff we've been talking about previously as well. Um, so one of the main uh, things we're concerned about in population level biology, oh, what is going on? Technical stuff, I'm gonna get my pointer. Um, one of the main things we're concerned about in population level biology is how we get this vast diversity in life on earth. Because as we've seen, they're, like our environment is very precious to us and that produces a lot of different types of organisms. But one of the key factors there is learning like how we actually get that, like from this tiny tree of life, part of the tree of life, how we get all these organisms. And um, turns out that's not just a rhetorical question. We know pretty well uh, the processes in which we get new species, which is called speciation, where we have one ancestral lineage that splits into two. And we can see that as we get all these speciation events, uh, they combine and we get a pretty large tree of life pretty quickly. Um, generally, we think of speciation as occurring in what's called allopatry, which is where there's like a geographic barrier. And then over time is the key factor here. Over time, um, genetic differences accumulate between these two groups until they become different enough to be considered separate species. Um, but recently we've discovered that speciation gene flow is possible. So even if there's no hard dividing line, um, differences can still accumulate. 
and th this is something that's a little like maybe not as intuitive um, because if there's nothing separating the like this side from this side, what's to stop everything from just getting mixed up? And the answer to that is that there are a couple forces that do that. The first one is called isolation by distance, which is just the idea that something over here, uh, maybe it like migrates over here, but it's not probably not going to migrate all the way over here. So things that are close by tend to look more genetically similar to each other just because it's harder to migrate long distances. Second is the idea of isolation by adaptation, which is where uh, if something here, even if it does make it over here, there's a completely different environment over here where this thing um, isn't as suited to live. So it's less likely, less likely to persist there. One of the things I'll say is that um, characterizing this is not trivial and kind of even looking beyond the scope of like a senior thesis, there have been entire papers that have basically been like, hey, here's this cool system. Let's find isolation by distance and isolation by adaptation. So that's what we could have done, but we wanted to look a bit deeper into the what's going on with the genome. Um, so kind of shifting gears a little bit, but, but we are going to come back to the idea of isolation by distance and isolation by adaptation, looking at this FST statistic that we normally use to measure genetic differentiation. Um, recently, this statistic has been criticized because it's correlated with a lot of other kind of unrelated features of the genome. It's intrinsically tied with low genetic diversity and which low genetic diversity is tied with higher gene counts and lower rates of recombination. So lower amounts of genetic material getting switched around. And this is due to linked selection. The reason for this is a bit technical, but generally the idea is uh, more selection happens in gene dense regions and it has a bigger effect if things aren't getting swapped a lot around to mitigate the effect. And then that will decrease genetic diversity, which will increase this uh, statistic that people sometimes use. And so we looked at all this criticism being thrown at the statistic. And instead of like seeing something terrible, we saw an opportunity um, because if this is all due to linked selection that can indicate genome divergence, then as we suspect that as populations, as species grow more and more distinct, that these trends should be stronger. So that's the main thing. We, and, and that is true. We know that as lineages diverge through time, as, as things get further and further apart, these trends, these correlations increase. So here we said, okay, we have these important trends that we know increase over time. And we know that some processes of isolation that occur over time can also occur over, over geographic distance and can also occur between environments. So let's see if these trends, these correlations also change across isolation by distance and isolation by adaptation. Um, yeah, so looking here to see if, uh, as we go across distance and we go across environments, if these trends change. Um, the system we're using for this is Mimulus Arantiacus, where it has a good range of environments. The background here um, indicates environmental variables. We see that the flowers look very different on both sides, indicating that there's been some adaptation, some to, to specific pollinators, and that this environmental gradient also occurs across a geographic gradient. So this system is really good for studying isolation by distance and isolation by adaptation. But the first thing we do before directly measuring isolation by distance and isolation by distance and isolation by adaptation here is characterizing population structure for the subspecies Tunisius and related subspecies Longiflorus and Callicinus. The reason for this is we kind of know pretty well what's going on here, but we know less about what's going on here and we just want to see where everything kind of groups genetically. Um, and to see how much like genetic subdivision there is within Punisius compared to related subspecies. Um, I'm guessing most people here do not have a like super extensive population genetics background, so I'm not going to focus too much on our uh, computational genomics. Basically, the main factor here is that we're using a SNP data set, which means that we're taking everything, we're only keeping the stuff that does vary between individuals, all the stuff that's the same across all individuals, we're just throwing out to make our data set more manageable. And what we find is within our subspecies Punisius, uh, we, we see that there's, there are a lot of genetic groups within Punisius here, and Longiflorus and Callicinus, in addition to them only having one group, they group together. So there are a lot of genetic groupings within Punisius. It's a very diverse lineage. And uh, in addition to that, this is a similar way of visualizing the same data, principal components analysis, um, where here we, we see that there are 
were able to group the individuals into three pretty distinct groups, where we have one that represents Longiflorus and Calicinus, one that represents the northern Punisius populations, and one that represents the southern Punisius populations. And the next thing we ask is, okay, so we know that differences between subspecies, like this difference here can be explained by differences in floral traits. So can, do we see differences in floral traits, traits between the northern Punisius and the southern Punisius? So this was a term of my work, and the answer to that question is no, they're the same. So basically because these points down here um, look the same as these points up here, that shows that these floral distributions are the same when we take as much of the variation of different floral traits and put them on the same axis using a principal components analysis. So that's kind of interesting that these things are very genetically distinct, but they look the exact same if you were to just look at them visually. Um, and here, the main point of this, we have our groups here, our northern Punisius, our southern Punisius, and our Calicinus and Longiflorus. The main point here is that the background represents the environment, environmental variables we measured, and that kind of as similar to what we saw in the introductory slide I showed, that there are these genetic groupings that change across um, the environment, which is also correlated with distance. So within here, this is a really good spot to test for isolation by distance and isolation by adaptation. We're also going to test the full data set with all Punisius individuals for a larger geographic span here. Um, we re-ran the data set because we needed, in our first data set, we only took uh, nucleotides, DNA letters that were uncorrelated with each other, um, but here we need them to be correlated with each other because we're looking for correlations. So that's basically the main difference. We end up with a bigger data set. Um, so now we're going to get to the meat of what we're actually find about isolation by distance and isolation by adaptation. And there's going to be a lot of data that I'm throwing at you kind of quickly. But the main point to focus on here is what's being compared, what the trend looks like, and how well it meshes up with the expected trend. So for our base measure of how different these things are genetically, um, Ecology and geography both explain genetic differentiation pretty well. When we get to this first correlation, FST and pi, uh, geography and ecology, again, both do a pretty good job of giving us the expected trend. Um, but for the last two here, uh, geographic distance explains the trend in the expected direction, but ecological distance does not. And so we, did a, we ended up doing a partial Mantell test to uh, factor out covariance between geography and ecology um, to see which, how, how much each variable explains independent of the other. And we see a similar result where geography and ecology both do a decent job of explaining these two, um, but geography is much better at explaining these trends here. And this is when I sent in my abstract. I'm like, yes, isolation by distance is very important. Um, and then the next day, the literal next day, I went, wait a minute, we have these two distinct populations. Isolation by distance assumes that there's like a gradient here. But we don't really see that. It looks more like these are kind of completely different. And when we look at this geographically, that's sort of what it looks like, that, that there's this like barrier here that's separating these two. So this really looks like more of a difference between two discrete lineages. Um, so that was what we ended up testing for. And it turns out the variation that can be explained by the difference in the genetic groups that we used in the first part of our analysis explains these trends a lot better than geography does. So when we look at the full data set, the main differences we see are based on differences due to lineages being kind of completely separate and discrete from each other. Right now we're looking at just the San Diego subset, the area where ecology varies a lot. Um, and again, gonna throw a lot of data at you but we just need to focus on um, what these trends, what these, what, what's being compared and how well these match up with the expected trend. So they both do a pretty good job of explaining genetic differentiation. They both do a decent job of explaining this FST uh, pi correlation. But the last two here are pretty wimpy. They don't, neither geography nor ecology really explain much of anything. And we did a partial Mantell test again to factor out the, the co-variation and what we found is that the main takeaway here is just this one point that they both do a good job of explaining genetic differentiation, but only ecological differences rather than geographic distance explains this trend here that tells us about link selection and genomic divergence. 
All right, so let's, I just throw a lot of stuff at you, but let's put everything together. Um, when we look at the full data set and we're asked, what's important for explaining these correlations that indicate link selection and genome divergence? When we look at the full data set, the main factor that explains this is differences in ancestry between these two discrete groups. But when we look at within this one group, it's isolation by adaptation rather than isolation by distance as a big factor. And so what does that mean? Basically, the takeaway here is that local ecology is really important, that um, we have all these different environments on Earth, and that is what allows there to be so much diversity in creating species and, and, and in allowing them to stay there. Without that, we'd have much fewer species than we do today, and it's really important to preserve those environments and preserve the local ecology so we can continue to observe and appreciate the vast diversity we see in life on Earth. Um, differences, and that is all I have. Thank you for listening. Thank right. you, Connor. That was awesome. Thanks. We'll open it up to questions. Um, if people have them, we can have about five minutes of questions before I'll open it up to just general discussion. And the presenters can also ask questions. So. I, well, I, I'd love to know, so as my, both my thesis and then my question to Abigail revealed, my climate change is the wheelhouse in which I work. So I'm curious, thinking about both local ecology and that adaptation was the, the big uh, divider between, in, within the species. How do you think climate change and the shifting of global climates is, especially on a local scale, is going to affect this kind of data or ASC's plants more specifically? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I will say, I'll preface this by saying that like any kind of hypothesis I make is not going to have rigorous data supporting it. Um, but my hypothesis would be that uh, in, in this case, let's see, it, it, it's a little tricky because the environment's pretty heterogeneous. The, let's see, the, let me go all the way back to this map here, this area, is, uh, if you can see my cursor, is, is kind of a desert. Um, and so if climate change further like dries out that area, it can be pretty bad for the plants over there. Um, and what might end up happening, I don't understand the local geography of California well enough to be able to say this for certainty, but what, what, what could happen is that uh, these plants could end up shifting over here as things get drier, over, drier and warmer over here and then push these out. Another thing that could happen is we know that one of the main factors in explaining what these flowers look like is due to pollinator selection. And pollinators might be more sensitive to these changes in weather, and to, to, to climate, to temperature and precipitation than these plants are. So if the pollinators change their ranges, that also affects where we're going to find the plants. Thank you. There are no other questions. Um, I'm going to move us into just an open discussion. Um, and this is just pretty much organic. So it could be anyone just sharing some general thoughts that you all want to share or just some closing remarks from our presenters. But it is um, time for us to share just anything in an open format discussion. So feel free if you want, you can turn your video on. But we have up to about 15 minutes for general discussion. I first off wanted to say that I enjoyed, this was, I love the undergraduate symposium. I try to help moderate um, anytime I can and I just learned so much from it. I'm so um, impressed with the quality of students that graduate from the U of O. I've worked at about five different institutions and I've never um, worked with students that are so academically rigorous and excited and passionate about different things. And I don't know a student that um, doesn't just have one major. Students always have something else that they're doing. And I just think it's really awesome the ability that you've had to do some research and be able to have this as kind of like the culmination of your experience. I think all of you are graduating this year. 
Is that correct? This is just like, I'm almost in tears, but I just get so excited for amazing students to kind of graduate from the U of O and carry on. I think it was just so amazing from my perspective to hear and learn from you all. And I'm just really excited. I don't know if you want to share. I know this is like a discussion. I don't know if anyone has anything to say, but maybe what your plans are after you graduate. Oh yeah, I have a PhD program I'm going to in the fall. Hopefully the coronavirus doesn't mess everything up, but yeah, I'll be in Ithaca. I'm doing a, I'm in uh, the horticulture program at Cornell. So I'll be starting there in the fall. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Congratulations, that's really exciting. Thank you. Um, I, I know I was hoping to take a year off and work uh, in for an environmental uh, nonprofit hopefully on international issues, but kind of wherever I could get a job. Uh, as you mentioned, Kata, the coronavirus is definitely changing a lot of people's plans. So uh, I'm kind of uh, maybe making the jump a bit early uh, to hope to either go to grad school or environmental law school. Um, and I actually was thinking, Abigail, as you were talking about your research, that I would love to be an environmental lawyer working on those kind of issues. So that's the end goal for me. I don't know what the timing looks like because coronavirus, but we'll see. Definitely, that's really exciting. Uh -huh. I will be taking a year off to study for the LSAT and apply to law school. I would love to become an environmental lawyer. It's what I've wanted to do since high school and just really environmental justice issues are really important to me. So helping people out that way and the environment. So that's what I'll be doing. That's very exciting. Thank you all for sharing. It was just really cool. Um, I'll just leave it open for a minute or so, or I'll count to 14 because that's a good teacher technique to see if anyone else has anything to say, but I'll just leave it open to final discussion remarks. I guess I've, I've been the talkative one. I'll just add, I appreciate it. I feel like we, it's really interesting to see the three of us approach three different issues that are all kind of in the wheelhouse of the environment from three really different perspectives. And I'll be honest, when I first read us three in a group, I was like, I don't really see how we connect, but I feel like there are definitely some common themes in all our research. So, and I, I feel like I, there's a lot of siloing that goes on at the school and it was really great to kind of see more of a natural science and more of a, uh, in that, that and humanities based approach to this work. So I really appreciate that. So thank you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you as well. Yeah, when, when I first got placed in this group, my first reaction was, oh, I guess they didn't have anyone else like doing what I did. But I think it did end up like working pretty well because that is one thing that I think um, population geneticists in my field sometimes forget is that like a lot of the reason we're doing this, a lot of the reason we care about populations being different, species being different is so that we can understand like why we have like the environments and the species in the world we do today. And that's very important when thinking about all these other topics and that it goes the other way too, that thinking about um, these aspects of like environmental justice are very important for actually making sure that uh, we have these different environments and these different ecologies and these different species that we can like continue to study and think about. Definitely, um, like you two were both saying, um, when I first saw the our little roster, I thought it was interesting, but I really, do enjoy the interdisciplinary field of environmental studies and I was able to really get new approaches to the field. So thank you both. It was really exciting to learn about what you both did. Great. Well, I think, I think I'm going to call it if that's okay. Um, thank you again for everything and good luck on your future endeavors. It was Great to be a part of this journey with you all. Laura, did you have anything else to say? No, I've been enjoying technical difficulties for the last 20 minutes. So I've been able to hear Connor, but not see any of his presentation, oh, but no. you all could. So I was glad and I've been, I've been chatting with the support folks to ask, can I leave the meeting and rejoin if I'm the host without messing up the recording? Turns out I can, but now we know. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you all. It was great to have you and good luck graduating virtually. I'll be also graduating virtually at a different institution, but um, it's a really interesting time and I wish you all luck in your future endeavors. Go Ducks. <laughs> and I also would like to 
uh, add on to what Heather said about how this was just really impressive work. You guys are great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks all. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.